All right. <laughs> that helps for some reason. It's beyond me, but all right. Okay, James. I'm going to back up a little bit, tell you where we are, just very briefly, and then we'll carry on. In chapter 1, I need my clicker. In chapter 1, verse 19 through 213, you remember that James calls his readers, these Jewish Christians who are outside Palestine, he calls them to be doers of the word in the midst of their trials. You remember they're being oppressed by rich unbelieving neighbors they're being persecuted he calls them to be doers of the word in their trials specifically he calls them to be doers of the word with regard to their anger and evil speech directed toward the oppressor oppressors and with regard to their showing of favoritism to the rich at the expense of the poor believers and then in chapter 2 14 to 26 James defends that call for them to be doers of the word. He defends it against a circulating false idea that works are irrelevant or insignificant for those in Christ. And he shows the error of that claim from an everyday example, from the fate of demons, and from Scripture. And then when we ended two weeks ago, we just started looking at chapter 3, whoops, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to read that again, say just a bit of what I said before because we had just gotten started, and then we'll go on from there. He says in chapter 3, verses 1 to 2, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that we will receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in speech... He is a complete man, able to bridle the entire body as well. So here James says that the existence of this error, that mere mental assent to the truths of Christ, that that's sufficient. That's this error that's out and about that he is addressing. When he calls them to be doers of the word, he then addresses that error that's out there. And the existence of that error, that this mere mental assent simply believing certain truths about Christ without surrendering to those, that that's somehow that kind of faith, that dead faith, is sufficient for salvation, that prompts him to issue a caution regarding teachers. And he says that not many of them should become teachers. And the reason he gives why not many of them should become teachers is that teachers will receive a stricter judgment. And last week, or two weeks ago, I read that quote from Douglas Moo about, you know, to whom much is given, much will be demanded. And the reason this stricter judgment should cause them to think twice about becoming teachers is that of all the ways human beings stumble, sinning in speech is among the easiest. The potential for sinning in speech is so great that's so great that if one could keep his tongue in check so as not to sin with it, if a person could do that, one could bring, bring anything under control. In other words, it's, it's so easy to sin in speech that if you could keep your tongue in check so as not to sin with it, then you'd be able to bring anything under control. And in that case, you would have arrived. You'd be complete or perfect or fully mature. See, so stricter judgment combined with the potential for stumbling that exists when you're running your mouth, when you're talking, as a teacher does. You see, so you've got stricter judgment and this potential for sinning when you're speaking, which is what a teacher does. Well, that, that, those two things together mean that you have to consider carefully you know, careful consideration is required before becoming a teacher. And that's what James is saying there. In saying that not many of them should become teachers, he's referring to their present state of spiritual immaturity. Not many of them should become teachers because of that. Not many of them were ready to be teachers. Now in Hebrews chapter 5, Verse 12, the writer there, he rebukes the immature 
for not progressing in faith so as to be able to teach. So they are, they're addressing immaturity. James and the writer of Hebrews are addressing immaturity from different directions. James says, in essence, you're too immature to be teaching. And the writer of Hebrews says, you shouldn't be so immature. So that's what James is saying. He says, listen, this teaching thing here, you have to be careful about it before you embark on this role. Because you have stricter judgment and this potential for stumbling when you speak. Then he says in chapter 3, verses 3 through the first part of 5, Now if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they will be responsive to us, we also guide their entire body. Also look at the ships. Though being so large and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder where the impulse of the pilot wills. In the same way, the tongue is a small member, yet boasts great things. See, caution is needed in becoming a teacher, not only because the teacher faces a stricter judgment and has a significant risk of stumbling because of how difficult it is to control the tongue and to keep from sinning in speech, so not only for you have those two, two things, but caution is needed in becoming a teacher also because teaching has a great influence on the direction of the church, the local body of Christ. You see, just as a small bit directs a horse and a small rudder directs a ship, so the small tongue directs the community's spiritual course. So it's no surprise that you see the inspired writers in the New Testament so often challenging and correcting things that were taught in the communities to which they wrote. Paul, James, Peter, John, Jude, all of them do it. And so does the Lord Jesus Christ in the letters to the churches in Revelation. And they did that because teaching matters. Teaching matters to the spiritual course of the community of faith. In the words of verse 5, the tongue boasts great things in that the teaching the tongue delivers can have tremendous effects. And exhibit A is the claim that James had heard was circulating that works are of no significance in the Christian life. That's a perfect example. If that were taught to Christians as the truth of God, the effects on the congregation would be catastrophic. Christians would become casual about sin. They would think that how I live is of no consequence to God. It doesn't matter at all to Him. And they'd be casual about sin and thus would be condemned. So you see how significant it is, and you see the urgency with which Jude addresses the same idea. The Lord's brother Jude, in Jude verses 3 and 4, he says, Beloved, although being very eager to write to you about the common, our common salvation, that's what I wanted to write about. I had a compulsion to write to you, urging you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men slipped in stealthily, the ones having been marked out long ago for this condemnation, godless men who have perverted the grace of our God into licentiousness. You see, the same idea that somehow God does not care how we live, it's about grace, you don't have to care a thing about morality. You don't have to live a consecrated life. All you have to do is simply believe these truths, receive grace, and live any way you want. Jude says, they perverted the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. In that they deny Him. You see, in that false idea, in that false teaching. Now the significance and the potential impact of teaching on the body of Christ, that's why elders, those who shepherd a congregation. That's why they must be skillful in teaching. You see in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, 
That's why Paul tells Titus in Titus chapter 1, verse 19, that an elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. Teaching matters for the life of the body of Christ. Now, churches throughout the country in this day and age, churches throughout the country are facing a strong postmodern current that is pushing them to minimize or ignore biblical doctrine to reduce the risk of turning off younger people. We're facing this strong current to minimize or ignore biblical doctrine to reduce this risk, at least as we perceive it, of turning off younger people. We are being culturally pressured to be like politicians, to say nothing concrete, to say nothing of theological substance so as not to give people anything with which to disagree. You see, we don't want to say something clearly, strongly, directly, so somebody can say, oh, I see, they think that's true. Because we think we live in a world where that will be offensive to people. That's the cultural pressure that we are facing. But that leaves the church to be conformed to the culture's vision. You know, there's no vacuum. You don't have an option of not treat, teaching biblical truth and doctrine. Because if you don't, that vacuum will be filled. The church will be conformed to the culture's vision rather than to God's will as revealed in the Bible. Just a few days ago, there was an article published online in Christianity Today. And Roger Olson, who's a theologian at Baylor University, his specialty is historical theology. But he's quoted in this article... And I thought what he said was just really right on. Olson says, there is a trend toward what I call generic Christianity that is, a, that is very feeling-centered and pragmatic and somewhat anti-intellectual. As denominational particularities are ignored or hidden, well, why are they ignored or hidden? Because we think that people won't like them. We think that they'll find that we're not inclusive enough or something. So we want to hide those things. He says, as denominational particularities are ignored or hidden, what's often left is a lowest common denominator, spirituality, that is often little more than, quote, worship and, quote, discipleship, devoid of cognitive content. The result is often folk religion. You see, this is culturally made up religion the result is often folk religion rather than historic classic biblical christianity and if the religion that we're a part of is not biblical christianity if it is a folk christianity that the culture has created it's not christianity it has to be biblical. So this is this idea. You see, James talking about the importance of teaching, you see. And then he says in chapter 3, 5 through 12, he says, See how a fire of small size ignites a forest of great size. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a world of unrighteousness placed among our members. It stains the entire body and sets on fire the course of life and is set on fire by hell. For all kinds of beasts and birds, of reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no man is able to tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and, the Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made according to God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth, pour forth the sweet and the bitter from the same opening? My brothers, can a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine figs? Neither can a salt spring produce sweet water. 
James here, he pivots. He pivots to the division or disharmony that exists among his addressees, that exists among the Jewish Christians to whom he's writing. He pivots to that by turning the discussion from the tongue's influence, from the tongue's ability to direct the course of things like horses and ships and spiritual communities. He turns from that to the tongue's destructiveness and the subject of division and disharmony within the group that he's writing to. That's going to occupy him down through chapter 4, verse 12. Now, we know there was division and disharmony among those to whom James is writing. We know that because he later addresses them. He sits here and he speaks of conflicts and quarrels. In chapter 4, verse 1, he speaks of their speaking against one another. In chapter 4, verse 11, and he speaks of their grumbling against one another. In chapter 5, verse 9, so it makes sense to see the cursing here. The cursing that he's talking about in chapter 3, verses 9 through 12, it makes sense to see that as something they were directing toward fellow Christians. It is something that is taking place within that community. Now certainly what he says about cursing, that would apply to cursing of non-Christians who are also made in the image of God. So certainly it would apply to them but I think his focus here is on their cursing each other. I think that's the, main, that's the focus here. You say, well, why would that come up? How would that come up? Well, this is one of the things. When you're reading letters, you have to try to you know, fill in and see. What do I think could be happening here that would drive these Christians? If you're going to, if you're going to say you think they're primarily, he's talking about the, the Christians cursing one another. Well, you see the division that they have. What could produce such a thing? Well, maybe the financial pressure that was brought on by the economic oppression caused some of the Christians to be stingy, caused some of them to love the world in the sense of focusing on unduly on how to gain more financial security. So here you are, you're, you're being hard-pressed by oppression. You're already outside. You're kind of an outsider out here. You're getting oppressed by rich people. So maybe that would cause some of the believers to hoard and not share with their brothers, their sisters. I can see that happening. And so, see, that this kind of thing, that might create complaining and bitterness and division and resentment. Because here we are, one fellowship, and I'm here having nothing. And you've somehow escaped so much of the oppression that you still are holding on to things. And you're not sharing it with me. Well, I could get really upset about that. I could see getting resentful about that. And so I can understand how this may have, something like that could have arisen. Indeed, the warning about grumbling against one another that you see in chapter 5, verse 9, that's given in the context of exhorting them to be to patience in the face of suffering so we right there we have at least some linkage between this grumbling against one another in a context of suffering so I think this is what's going on here now James he compares the destructive potential of a small fire the destructive potential of a small fire you see something that can burn down a huge forest right you come with this little flame, and that baby can burn that whole forest down. You see, it has tremendous destructive potential. And he compares that destructive potential of a small fire to that of the tongue, which he labels a fire. He says it's a fire. And contrary to pure and undefiled religion, which requires one to keep oneself unspotted by the world. You remember in chapter 1, verse 27? The tongue, he says, it stains the entire person and it wreaks havoc throughout one's life. Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 15, verse 11, and verse 18 and 19, that what comes out of a person's mouth is what makes him unclean. And in elaborating, he noted that the mouth expresses the heart in which are found evil thoughts, murder, adultery, 
sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. So you see, James is focusing on these things, the tongue and the potential destructiveness that resides there. And it's saying the tongue is set on fire by hell. In chapter 3, verse 6, in the second part there, I think he's saying that, that sinful speech ultimately, ultimately leads to judgment where the tongue, along with the entire person, experiences the fire of hell. I think that's what he's saying. I mean, he could be saying, however, he could be saying that the tongue derives its destructive power, its fire, that it derives that destructive power from Satan, the one who's most intimately associated with hell. In other words, he could be saying that Satan's the one who is exploiting this avenue of sinfulness. He's in the mix. I mean, he's in the mix whether or not that's what James is talking about here. But I think it's probably the former. And then in verses 7 and 8, he reminds us that the tongue is extremely difficult to bring under control. Don't you know that? Let me ask the married people. Don't you know that your tongue is extremely difficult to bring under control? Aren't there things that you've uttered that you would like to have sucked back real fast and that's just too bad, it doesn't work that way? Well, you understand that. You don't have to be married to understand that. See, mankind's prowess in taming things is evident in its taming of all kinds of creatures, but no man can thoroughly subdue the tongue. And we're taming all kinds of stuff. We're great at it. But no man can thoroughly subdue the tongue. It's a restless evil in the sense it just won't quit. It's restless. It simply won't quit. Just when you think you've mastered it, you will find yourself lying or boasting or flattering or gossiping or slandering or abusing or cursing, or speaking obscenely, you'll see it's just always something, always something that, you know, wants to come out. And you'll find that. Douglas Moo in his commentary on James, he says, does James and or the New Testament as a whole envisage the possibility of Christians attaining perfection in this life? We've answered this question in the negative. No. You're not going to attain perfection here. That's only at the consummation. That's only in eternity when your sanctification is complete. You and I will limp along here in this overlap of ages, struggling to, to be fully sanctified. But he says, James does indeed suggest that the ultimate taming of the tongue is impossible. Should this lead us to abandon all efforts to bring our speech under control? Can't you see somebody say, listen, if I can't be perfect, I'm never going to be perfect in this life. I'm only going to be per perfect when the Lord comes and the sanctification and the work of the Spirit that He's doing in my life now will then be brought to completion. Only then. Well, then why, why do I even try? Why do I even try to live a holy and sanctified? You can see people saying that. Okay? That's the question he raises here. He says, should this lead us to abandon all efforts to bring our speech? Of course not. The realization that perfection is unattainable should not dampen in the least our enthusiasm to become as good as it is possible. We may never reach the point where the tongue is perfectly controlled, but we can surely advance a long way in using our speech to glorify God. And that is what we are to do as Christians. The Spirit of God who lives in us is transforming us into the image of Jesus. And you and I are to yield and allow the Spirit's work in our lives to be done. And the Spirit will take us, and if you've been a Christian any time at all, you can look back on your life and you can see the graph is up. You are no longer the person you once were. But are you perfect? Okay, you know you're not. But you pursue, you yield, 
You let the Spirit transform you. You don't wind up saying, hey, because I won't be transformed perfectly in this life, in this overlap of ages, then I'm not going to yield at all to the Spirit. I'm going to just go ahead and do what I want. I'm going to be the way I want to be instead of the way God calls me to be. You don't do that. Now, cursing, cursing is not simply abusive language as we tend to think of it. It is in the sense that James means calling in anger for God to cut a person off from any possible blessing and to consign that person to hell. You see, more generally, cursing in a biblical sense is calling from ill will for evil to befall another person. It's exemplified in something like this. I wish you would die. You see, that is a curse. I wish you would die is my expression of a desire out of ill will that some kind of evil befall you. Now, Christians are to bless those who curse them. Jesus says that in Luke chapter 6, verse 28, Paul in 1 Corinthians 4, 12. And Christians are not to curse those who persecute them. Paul says that in Romans chapter 12, verse 14. But that doesn't mean that cursing others, calling on God to punish them, that that's always wrong. See, Paul, writing by the Spirit of God, he sometimes invokes curse formulas. 1 Corinthians 16, 22, if anyone does not love the Lord, let him be a cursed one. Our Lord come. Galatians 1, 8, 9, but even if we are an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the gospel we let him be a cursed. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let him be a cursed. So there can be a cursing, you see. There can be a cursing that is noble, and godly as where one seeks to expose to others the gravity and danger of the cursed person's conduct or where one desires that God's glory and purpose be vindicated I mean given that the psalmists the psalmists cry out to God for justice against the perpetrators of evil against them you see for example in Psalm 69 Verses 22 to 28 and many other places. And Psalms, by the way, that was the hymn book of the temple and was used freely by the early church. Well, given that the psalmists cry out for justice against the perpetrators of evil against them, and given that the souls of the martyrs in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, they cry out to know how long it will be before God judges and avenges their blood, God accepts. And he even invites these expressions of the heart. Here's what Peter David says. He says, the New in the New Testament, one finds the words of Jesus forbidding cursing as well as those of Paul. But apparently such prohibitions were not interpreted as absolute in all circumstances. For Paul certainly expressed at least curse-like formulas. And Jude, to name another example, is virtually a long curse pronouncement on certain teachers. What James appears to be referring to is the use of a curse in anger, especially in inner church party strife. See, what I think is going on here is, is parallel to what you see with anger. As with anger, the key to whether such an appeal is acceptable seems to be the motive that produces it. You see, if it's motivated by wounded pride, if it's motivated by a desire to have God serve as one's muscle to show an enemy that he can't mess with me. You mess with me and you're getting it because do you know who I am? How dare you mess with me? Like to the extent it's motivated by that. See, by pride to have God serve as your muscle to show somebody they can't mess with you, well, it's that self-centeredness is wrong if it's motivated by a desire for God to express express his glory in rendering justice and being faithful to his word and his commitment to the victims of unrighteousness well then it's acceptable now that's an admittedly a fine that's admittedly a fine line 
But so is the motivational line between righteous anger or righteous indignation and sinful anger, as we talked about before. Jesus was angry, and yet he never sinned. And yet we know anger is sinful. So there is a form of anger that is not sinful. It is the form of anger that Jesus expressed. And we talked briefly about well, what distinguishes the two. I think something analogous is at work here. And it has to do with the, mo with the motivation. And given, that, and given that it's a fine line, which I certainly think it is, the crossing of which we can so readily rationalize, I think that before we engage in righteous anger or in what one might call righteous cursing, calling for God's honor to be vindicated in this situation, I think we, we might be wise particularly when it involves something that was done to us personally, well, we at least have to be hypervigilant. But it may even be wise when it deals with us personally just to stay away from that because of how fine the line is and because of how readily we can rationalize crossing that line. When it's about us, wisdom may dictate that we just uh, chill on it. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to say that would be absolute, I'm just giving you that as I, I can recognize the danger here in saying, well, that there is a kind of cursing and there's a kind of anger that is righteous. So then taking that and baptizing all of your sinful anger, that's a danger. Now, it's less so when it's something done to somebody else because it's away from you. But when it's done to you, warning, Will Robinson. Okay? Just be careful. Be very, be hypervigilant in that situation. James chapter 3 verse 13 to 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good behavior his, his achievements in humility born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and rivalry in your heart, do not boast and do not lie against the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where there is envy and rivalry, there's disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And the crop of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now continuing his instruction, as I see it, as I track the flow of thought, continuing his instruction regarding sins of division, James warns his readers about envy and rivalry. Apparently, now from what he says here, it looks like envy and rivalry were being cloaked, were being hidden with a claim of wisdom. In other words, it seems envy and rivalry, they were being spun or being justified as appropriate exercises of wisdom. So it, I was, they were using it. What was really driving them, these are expressions of envy and rivalry, but they masked the envy and rivalry. They justified their envy and rivalry, somehow cloaking it in a claim that this is really just wisdom in action. And James tells them, look, James says that those who are wise and understanding in the things of God, that they must manifest by good behavior their growth in the humility that true wisdom produces. They must manifest by good behavior their achievements, their growth in the humility that true divine wisdom produces. See, if contrary to such humility based behavior. They have envy and rivalry in their hearts. Okay, if instead of this humility-based behavior, they've got envy and rivalry in their hearts, they have no business of boasting of being wise. They have no business of doing that. In doing that, they contradict the truth. They contradict the truth that wisdom breeds humility. You see, when he says here, if you have, do not boast and do not lie against the truth. 
We say, what, what, what are you talking about boasting? That's what I'm telling you. I think what is going on is they are boasting in envy and rivalry by claiming it as an expression of wisdom. And he says, don't boast if you're doing this stuff, if you don't have this humility-based behavior, but instead have envy and rivalry. Don't be boasting about it, and don't be lying against the truth. The truth is, wisdom breeds humility. And you're denying that. So he tells them not to do that. Now, whatever wisdom they have, he tells them it's not from above. I understand you're talking about wisdom. You think you got wisdom, and I'm telling you, whatever wisdom you have is not from above. It's earthly, it is unspiritual, it is demonic. And its demonic origin is shown by the fact envy and rivalry, you see, the, the conduct producing attitudes that are born of their so called wisdom, its demonic origin is shown by the fact envy and rivalry. They produce what? They produce disorder, which is contrary to God, division, carping, breaking, all of these things. It produces disorder and, and every evil practice. Then he contrasts that. He says, look, in contrast, those possessing true wisdom, those who have wisdom of God, those who have the true wisdom that is from above, they are first and foremost pure. They're unadulterated in their pursuit of the things of God. They are not double-minded. They are not adulterated and mixed. I got one foot in the world. I got one foot over here. Wisdom understands that it's about God. It's not about me, what I want, how I can get over on people. It's about God. So he says, first of all, it's pure. Secondly, he says it's peaceable, gentle, compliant. They make peace because the person who has wisdom from God is gentle and compliant. We might say deferential. They're not combative. They're not pugnacious. They're not itching to fight and argue at the drop of a hat. They're not like that. That's not what divine wisdom produces in a human being. So they're, they're not like that, you see. They're not combative, but they're willing to go along when unalterable principles are not involved. And of course, Paul's a good example. 1 Corinthians 9, 22, I've become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. He was willing to have Timothy circumcised. You remember? He said, hey, I think this, this might bother some people. Go ahead. Now, let's go ahead and let's ease things. Now, that's different when somebody comes and they says, he must be circumcised to be saved. Now, when they say that, different game. Because if he did that, then he would be acquiescing in that lie, and he can't do that. So that's like with Titus. He said, we wouldn't give in to him. But you see, he's, he's deferential in looking to create peace, looking to create harmony, looking to create unity in the spirit and to experience that. He says here that they are full of mercy and good fruits, impartial. They exhibit mercy, kindness, and honor without prejudice to their neighbors, unlike how they treated the poor man in chapter 2, verse 13. And what does that produce? Well, that produces unity. That produces goodwill. That produces warmth. And that's what the church is to have. They're sincere. They're genuine. Acting without show or pretense. That's what the wisdom from above, true wisdom, generates. Those who are peacemakers. You see, the truly wise who live humility-based lives are thereby sowing a crop of righteousness. You see, you go, what? Yes, those who live humility-based lives, those who are truly wise, they are sowing a crop of righteousness because an environment of peace is conducive to righteousness. Just as envy and rivalry are conducive to every evil practice. You see, peace is the community 
context, the state of bodily health. It's that state in which spiritual nourishment, spiritual strengthening, spiritual encouragement flows through the body. See, peace and unity among a group of people, that then allows this mutual flowing of edification, strengthening, encouragement, all that. That is a healthy body. That is a healthy body, so it's conducive, you see, to righteousness. The disorder and evil practices against one another, these kinds of lines and chopping and dividing, you see, that winds up, those things that are born of envy and rivalry, that is a bodily disease that hinders flourishing. That is the opposite. It does, it's not conducive to righteousness. It's conducive to every evil practice. Whereas the bodily, bodily health is unity and peace because that is the context in which the body of Christ flourishes. Dividing, you're not simply hurting yourself and the other people. When the church fragments and divides, the body is sick. And as a sick body, it's then not flourishing as it should. Because the flow through the body is not as it should be. And so this is what I think James is telling them. You see, not a bodily disease. So those who really have wisdom, those who live this humility-based lives that are born of divine wisdom, they create an environment of peace, and in doing that, they create an environment that is conducive to righteousness. Unlike the people who live based on envy and rivalry, who create division, and that is not conducive to righteousness. That brings about every evil thing. That's what I think he's after. All right, he says here in 4, what is the source of conflicts and quarrels among you? Do they not come from your pleasures that battle in your members? You want and you do not have. So you kill and are filled with jealousy. You're unable to obtain, so you quarrel and wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Douglas Moo says, the quarrels of James's day have too often marred the Christian church. Is that second bell? Ah, there you go. Lord willing, next week. Thank you.